South Park and serialization, a subject that has been a bit of a debate in the fandom over the past seven or eight years now. Is it ruining the show or has it breathed new life into it? I don't know if there's a definitive answer, but while many people attribute serialization to the most current era of South Park, the reality is that they were dabbling in serialized elements for years before embracing it more thoroughly, arguably dating back to season one. So I thought it might be fun to take a look back and explore the entire history of serialization in South Park and talk a little bit about whether it's changed the show for the better or worse. South Park has had its fair share of multi-part episodes over the series history, but the first was actually the finale of season one, Cartman's Mom is a Dirty Slut, where the primary mystery is determining who Cartman's father is. Who is Eric Cartman's father? Is it Jimbo? Ah! Or is it the 1991 Denver Broncos? And while I think it's fair to argue that two or three part episodes maybe shouldn't count as serialization, this did show that Matt and Trey were interested in telling a continuous story over multiple episodes, cliffhanging the mystery at the end of part one and leaving the reveal to be answered in part two. They even trolled the audience here by instead playing Terrence and Philip Not Without My Anus as the season two premiere, delaying the follow-up for a full week. This was probably mostly meant to parody season-ending cliffhangers like the infamous Who Shot JR storyline in Dallas, which was also parodied in The Simpsons' Who Shot Mr. Burns two-parter, but I think we can count it here as an early example of multi-part storytelling in South Park. South Park would deliver countless multi-part episodes over the years, including Cartoon Wars, Go God Go, Imagination Land, Pandemic, 200 slash 201, the Coon and Friends trilogy, You're Getting Old, the Black Friday trilogy, and Time to Get Serial. I'm not going to fully explore every single one of these, but we will definitely dive deeper into a few of them later. But next up in South Park's experimentation with serialized elements was in season three with a trio of episodes called Cat Orgy, Two Guys Naked in a Hot Tub, and Jubilee. This is actually a pretty cool little experimental trio, often dubbed the Meteor Shower trilogy. They don't tell one continuous story across three episodes, but all three episodes do take place on the same night, the night of the Meteor Shower. Each episode follows different members of the main gang. Cat Orgy shows Cartman being babysat by Shelly. Two Guys Naked in a Hot Tub focuses on Stan going to a party with his parents, with a substantial portion of the plot focusing on Randy and Gerald in a hot tub. And Jubilee covers Kyle and Kenny's night as Kyle invites Kenny to the titular Jubilee, a sort of Jewish Boy Scout type gathering. Obviously, all being set on the same night, there are major connections between the three episodes. Mr. Mackey's party is a major aspect of this, being the main location for Two Guys Naked in a Hot Tub, but the reason Shelly is babysitting Eric is because his mom is going to that party, and the Broflovskis drop Kyle and Kenny off at Jubilee before going to the party themselves. The Meteor Shower trilogy is not really a fully serialized story, but it did show Matt and Trey's interest in a bit more nuanced interconnectivity between their stories, and very early in the show's run. Season 4 starts to introduce some of the first status quo shifts for South Park, moving the kids into fourth grade, and even introducing an entirely new teacher, Miss Chokes on Dick. Yes, that's actually her name. Mr. Garrison becomes the kindergarten teacher, and this remains the status quo for a while a pretty substantial change. They wouldn't bring Garrison back to teach the gang again until season six. But I think the first real example of serialization in South Park has got to be the end of season five leading into season six, when they decide to kill Kenny off for real. Obviously, it was an ongoing joke that Kenny would die in nearly every episode of the show, but the end of season five features an episode simply titled Kenny Dies. My guy Blooms actually made a great video about this season. You should definitely go check that out if you haven't seen it yet. But it wasn't as though they just killed Kenny for a year and ignored him. They actually talked about it a lot, and it had a major focus in the episode Ladder to Heaven. After the kids win a contest and realize that Kenny had the winning ticket, they try to build a ladder to heaven so they can claim their prize. Where were you when they built the ladder to heaven? This even leads to another little serialized storyline. Cartman drinks Kenny's ashes, thinking they're chocolate milk, and then for a few episodes, his soul shares Cartman's body. Cartman will occasionally just yell out Kenny's thoughts. Yeah, luckily Cartman's big enough for the both of us. Shut up, Kenny. This leads to Kenny's soul being exercised from Cartman's body, and then moved into a pot roast, which is eventually eaten by Rob Schneider, who goes on to make a movie about Kenny's life, starring as Kenny. While this was really only the focus of a few separate episodes, it was definitely a serialized subplot. Although ultimately, Kenny just sort of reappears like nothing ever happened. They dabbled in other smaller serialized aspects after this as well. Garrison gets a sex change before deciding to detransition, like three seasons later. And that was a status quo shift that they maintained. And then this is when they really started to play with the multi-part episodes more often, basically starting with Cartoon Wars. But the first one I really want to dive into is Season 11's incredible Imagination Land trilogy. Honestly, one of my favorite things to ever come out of South Park. Imagination! 
Sean. But while it is a three-part serialized story, they also started to do something that we hadn't seen much prior to this. Much more heavily incorporate previous South Park stories into an entirely new narrative. The trilogy focuses on the discovery of a place called Imagination Land, in which everything that anyone has ever imagined or made up actually exists. So, it's filled with classic fictional characters like Luke Skywalker, Gandalf, Wonder Woman, and Morpheus. It's a really fun concept. But this also gave them the freedom to bring back some of the stuff that South Park characters had imagined in previous episodes, reintroducing the woodland critters from Cartman's Christmas Story, and bringing back Al Gore to warn the world about Man Bear Pig, who exists in Imagination Land, and ends up coming through a portal and terrorizing this government lab. What does that look like to you? It's Man Bear Pig! Obviously, this is not actual serialization, but this is one of the first times they took multiple previous plot lines and majorly incorporated them into a new multi-part story. And it wouldn't be the last either, because a couple of seasons later, they would tie together previous stories in probably the most substantial way the series has ever seen, to celebrate their 200th episode. Season 14's 200 and 201 take countless previous South Park stories from its entire history and weaves them together into an absolutely bonkers narrative that would be borderline incomprehensible if you had never seen the episodes it draws from. They even start the episode showing Cartman and Kyle bickering and specifically mentioning the season one and two storyline about Cartman's biological father. You guys, stop! All you're doing is rehashing a bunch of old stuff! They really just immediately called themselves out here. The episode ropes in Tom Cruise, previously seen in the Trapped in the Closet episode that was hypercritical of Scientology, and actually plays on the real-world controversy that stemmed from the episode, when Cruise tried to get the episode pulled from the airwaves. Likewise, in the episode, Tom Cruise threatens to sue South Park because the kids say something true about him. But I'm not a fudge packer! Then why are you packing fudge? This leads to Cruz gathering all of the celebrities that South Park has ever made fun of on the show in its entire history to take part in a class action lawsuit. Bono, Russell Crowe, Martha Stewart, Kanye, Mel Gibson, Tiger Woods, George Lucas, the list goes on. It's literally everyone. In order to stop the lawsuit, Tom Cruise requests that they help him meet Muhammad, the prophet of the Muslim faith. Ooh. That's tricky. This is, of course, following up the Cartoon Wars two-part story where Family Guy tried to show an image of Muhammad on their show, in the South Park universe, of course. This once again embraced the real-world controversy surrounding that, as that episode was actually censored by Comedy Central. Cruz's plan is to transfer Muhammad's ability to be censored and not be made fun of to himself and all of the other celebrities, so that South Park can never make fun of them ever again. Unfortunately, there's another group that wants that ability, the Ginger Kids, tying into Season 9's episode, Ginger kids. The episode also brings back Cartman's hand version of Jennifer Lopez from Season 7's Fat Butt and Pancake Head, though revealing she's actually an imposter named Mitch Connor, who lures Cartman to follow his plan by teasing him with the truth about his father. It also brings back Mecha Streisand, not seen since Season 1, in a fancy new updated model, but it all pales in comparison to the huge reveal at the end of 201. The leader of the Gingers is none other than Scott Tennerman, from the famous episode Scott Tennerman Must Die. And as it turns out, Cartman's real father was the Denver Broncos. But actually, it was Jack Tennerman, Scott's father, who played for the Denver Broncos. You killed your own father, and then you fed him to your half- Brother! And to top off the entire episode, they help Tom Cruise by sending him somewhere where he can be happy, the moon, with Will Zix. <laughs> While the episode obviously features major aspects from the entire series to this point, it's basically directly following up the episodes Mecha Streisand, Cartman's Mom is a Dirty Slut, Super Best Friends, Scott Tennerman Must Die, Fat Butt and Pancake Head, Ginger Kids, Trapped in the Closet, Free Will Zix, and Cartoon Wars. Obviously, this is sort of a retroactive serialization. None of these episodes were related or continued each other's stories, but now through 200 and 201, they all tie together, and we sort of see them use this same methodology in some of the other serialized seasons down the road. 200 and 201 are probably the most substantial example of tying old storylines together, but the Coon and Friends trilogy came later in season 14 and did something that I have always loved. Not only did they follow up the season 13 episode The Coon, which did leave us on a cliffhanger in regards to Mysterion true identity, but it effectively wove that identity mystery into one of South Park's longest-running gags. These episodes reveal that Mysterion is Kenny, and that his power is that he cannot die. I mean, come on, how do you not give them kudos for that reveal? Just taking what was once a bit and revealing that Kenny actually truly experiences these countless deaths over and over. He's basically living this cursed life. And I love this little bit of connectivity because it not only made for a great reveal, but it actually adds an entire layer of complexity to Kenny's character. Season 15's You're Getting Old used Randy's ongoing hijinks as a major catalyst behind his divorce with Sharon, which is undone in the follow-up episode Asperger's, of course. The Black Friday trilogy was 
not only a three-part episode, but also teased the beginnings of the game South Park The Stick of Truth, so you can kind of consider it a little bit serialized with that game. But in season 18, South Park started to explore serialization in earnest, not just tying old ideas together or briefly following stories up, but trying to actually tie the outcome of each episode into the inciting incident of the following episode, mostly in small ways. The one thing the season did run through nearly beginning to end was the idea that Randy was secretly moonlighting as pop sensation Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. I am Lord, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm Lord, yeah, 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 yeah. Season 19 starts to dive into interconnectivity even more, beginning with a major status quo shift, the introduction of a new character, PC Principal. This season also introduces the idea that Garrison is going to run for president as South Park's Trump surrogate, and it also has an ongoing story about gentrifying certain areas of South Park, building the Soto Sopa district, and then historic Shitty Paw Town, and even luring a Whole Foods into setting up shop in South Park. This season still had standalone stories, even though they tied into some of the other ideas ideas at play, like the episode Naughty Ninjas focusing on the kids using the now abandoned Soto Sopa as their base to play ninjas. But season 20, for better or worse, fully embraces serialization. Nearly every episode of the season ends on a cliffhanger and has ongoing mysteries and storylines, such as the member berries, the search for online troll Skank Hunt 42, Cartman's banishment from his friend group and subsequent relationship with Heidi Turner, and of course, the 2016 election. While it's ambitious, it's clear that this was very difficult and messy for the crew, because because they were still writing the show week to week. Forming a fully interconnected story while still relying on the most current events is an exciting prospect, but ultimately made the show really difficult. They were definitely convinced that Hillary Clinton was going to win the 2016 election, but when she didn't, that episode very obviously had to be changed drastically last minute. And they had to commit to using Garrison as the president of South Park for four years. They really wrote themselves into a hole there. Ironically, the final episode of the season is called The End of Serialization as we know it, and though they never leaned this hard into the idea again, it obviously wasn't the end of serialization. So that was a fucking lie. But season 21 did take a huge step back in that regard, really only focusing on a single serialized storyline in the background of the season, Cartman and Heidi's ongoing relationship. Over the season, Heidi becomes more and more like Cartman, and eventually they break up in the season finale. This season also had the superhero-themed episode franchise prequel, which was meant to act as a lead-in to the next South Park video game, The Fractured But Whole. Season 22 looked a bit more like season 21 in terms of ongoing stories, but they did take it a step further. There were themes and ideas that were prevalent throughout the season, such as focus on school shootings and the introduction of Tegrity Farms, but nothing was too linear like in season 20. Though, the episodes Time to Get Serial and Nobody Got Serial were direct follow-ups to the classic episode Man Bear Pig. I actually made an entire video about this. It's basically Matt and Trey exploring their previous take on climate change within the narrative of their show, revealing that Man Bear Pig was real all along, and the season finale sort of ties in a bunch of the season's individual stories together loosely. Randy and Tao use the scooters from the Halloween episode The Scoots to deliver their weed, Santa comes to town to try and help stop Jeff Bezos, but leaves because he's infuriated that they banished Mr. Hanky from town in the episode The Problem with Apu. And ultimately, Randy is able to stop Jeff Bezos by getting everyone super stoned with his Tegrity weed. It sort of feels like they took the methodology they used in 200 and 201, tying independent stories together to appear as though it was one ongoing narrative, but limiting it to a single season. Season 23 takes an interesting route, opting to change the show's focus to Integrity Farms instead of South Park. While each episode is sort of its own thing, they all focus on Randy losing more and more integrity in his pursuit of financial success at Tegrity Farms. He bombs home growers, sells out to China, creates plant-based burgers, and then kills an entire herd of cows because he can't take care of them. The sixth episode acts as the Tegrity Farms finale, where Randy is put on trial for all of these crimes. The show then opted to run a few standalone episodes before tying the actual season finale back into the Tegrity story, as Randy sells the town cocaine-laced marijuana because of a new alcohol ban. Season 24 only consists of four specials, two run on Comedy Central and two run on Paramount Plus, but these all tie together pretty directly, and they tie to season 23. The pandemic special reveals that the cause of the coronavirus was something that Randy did on his trip to China in the season 23 episode Banned in China something that we will not show you on screen. Then, the vaccination special follows this up by bringing Garrison back to South Park, no longer the Trump surrogate, and getting his job back teaching fourth grade. But the end of the special reveals that the gang has decided to split up and not be friends anymore, which ties directly into the post-COVID specials on Paramount+. Plus. Set 40 years in the future, showing a dystopian Blade Runner-inspired time period where COVID has completely changed how the world operates. The story begins when they learn that Kenny has died, and eventually they discover that he'd been trying to go back in time not to stop COVID, 
but to stop their friend group from splitting up. In the second post-COVID special, Stan, Kyle, and Cartman succeed in going back and attempt to change the events of the vaccination special, ultimately reuniting their younger selves as friends and changing the future. And season 25 sort of reels things a little bit further back, even though they started to lean back into linear stories with the specials. There are some status quo shifts in these six episodes that continue episode to episode, like Tolkien's family starting a cannabis farm called Credigree across the street from Tegrity, and Cartman and his mother moving into a hot dog house because they can't afford anything else. And these aspects in turn continue into the Streaming Wars specials, which also brings back a bunch of stuff from South Park's history, like P.P. -P and his water park, as well as the return of Man Bear Pig, basically operating as muscle for P.P. -P. These two specials obviously directly tie into one another, and they also basically tease the audience again, leading us to believe that Randy is giving up Tegrity Farms, but by the end he's forced to readopt his persona to save the day. And that's where we're at with the history of serialization in South Park. Season 26 is a few weeks away, and it remains to be seen how many serialized elements we might see. But the question everyone debates is whether or not these serialized stories actually work for South Park. And as you can see throughout their history, they've broached the format in a huge variety of ways. I think it's very clear to the audience and to Matt and Trey that experiments like season 20 just didn't work. It was an exciting idea that ultimately got derailed by the unpredictability of real world events. It's too tough to tighten your interconnected story when you're writing it on the fly. I think seasons that used smaller serialized elements but largely remained episodic worked much better. And personally, I think they found a pretty great balance with this last season. Having a couple of smaller through lines in the short six episode seasons on Comedy Central, and then really doing a bigger continuous story for the pair of Paramount Plus specials that they drop each year. It kind of allows them to have their cake and eat it too. And I would love to see more experimental stuff in the Paramount specials like post-COVID or Imagination Land, and more grounded kid-centric stories in the episodic stuff. I also have a real love for the way they used to handle interconnectivity in their storytelling. 200 and 201 remain some of the most fun episodes of the show for me, tying the history of the series together in a really fun and unexpected way. And it seems like they still like to approach some stories this way. I mean, just look at Streaming Wars. So season 26 starts in February, and I'm guessing we'll get the following specials in the summer. And it's going to be really interesting to see how it goes this year. Will they follow the same formula they did last year? Will they completely change it up? I'm eager to find out. But how do you feel about South Park's entire history of interconnected storytelling and serialization? Do you miss the old ways they used to dabble in it? Or do you want them to embrace the linear storytelling? Let me know below in the comments, and I'll see you next time. Peace. Johnny!